All right, guys, I'm like happily here to introduce our guest, Miss Mo Isom. She is, I have some notes here because she's just that phenomenal. I don't like want to mess it up. But I do know that she's a New York Times bestselling author for two books that she recently has written. She also has, thank you. Look at those muscles. Yeah, Joy, round of applause for Joy. <laughs> All right, yes, so she is a former LSU goalkeeper. Um, All-American. She also sets the record at LSU for um, the all-time goalkeeper. So pretty much she was just a stud in the net. No, no soccer balls were getting past her for uh, any of you not sports people, which is totally okay. Um, she's also, she's also is a very great speaker, encourager. She's got an awesome faith-centered blog. You can check her out. Um, she's married to Jeremiah Aiken, and she has two kids living in Atlanta, which is ironic. That's where Lecrae is living, too, which is, you know, they can have a party or something. Um, so she's here, um, which is great because the boys aren't here, but she's here to talk about some grace and forgiveness and trying to figure out who you are as a person and then changing it up a little bit in the second session. So, guys, listen, I'm just so excited for what the Spirit's going to be bringing like, this is just going to be such an awesome day. I, like, can't wait. So let's everyone give a round of applause for Mo Isom. Thank you. Nice. This is perfect. Hi, girls. Hi. Um, I am really excited to be here because um, we get two sessions together today, which means we get, like, double time to break some things down, and God has a really powerful word for you all that I know he wants to speak over you, but also because it just gets to be girls, which kind of changes the ball game. And I love that. I wish we could all just be like makeup list how we really want to be and shoes off and pajamaed. Um, but we're here and we get to just sort of dive in together. I appreciated the intro. I do have an athletic background. Um, I've been traveling and speaking and writing since I finished up at college. But the best part of me is, y'all, I just need to be completely frank, I have a smoking hot husband. It is, <laughs> like, Jeremiah is six foot five. He's built like, honey. He's, <laughs> it's like, the stature just captivates me. Um, I'm six foot one, if you see me eye level. So we're big people. Um, six months into marriage, we found out we were expecting our first. Um, Y'all, she's now almost three. Her name is Auden Noel. She is three and a half feet tall. This child is not even three years old, and she's like this tall. We're like, oh God. <laughs> um, our second one, Asher Rain, is she'll be one next week, and y'all, she is in like 24-month clothes. She's as bald as Bruce Willis, and she's so <laughs> precious. Y'all can check out my Instagram after the talk to just soak up all things baby. Um, but we're just big people, we're avatars. We just roam around Atlanta, uh, colossal sized. And actually my own mother doesn't know this yet, so this is top secret, but we're expecting again. So three babies in four years. Y'all should see the amount of spandex I have on under this and the stretch marks that have just written my children's name on my stomach. It's glorious! Um, but we love it, we love family, and I'm just honored and excited that I get to travel still and, um, and trust my husband with the littles and um, just share my heart with you guys because I care really passionately about your generation and about my generation, this millennial generation. And what's the younger one, Gen Xers? Is that what we're calling them? Are you guys the Tide Pod eaters or are you a little bit older? <laughs> it's like a mix. Someone's like, oh, she knows about Karen. She saw the YouTube video. No, I'm just passionate about this young generation because I see God stirring something unfathomable. I mean, I can't even picture the fullness and the great measure of it, but he is stirring it in my generation, in your generation. He is rising up the body of Christ in response to great attack that we're coming under. We live in a world that is, that is, is under tremendous attack, but... God is so faithful to pour out his spirit so fully. And he is raising up his sons and his daughters in power, in activation, in great measure. There is a lot on the horizon. So I'm passionate about sharing my heart with the generation because there's, there's, great, there's great expectation 
for what God is and is going to do through you as his daughters. And I just think it's incredible that we can come around that in sort of a world that is confused around all that it means to be woman or to celebrate womanhood, but kind of at the diminishing of men. And, and we're, we're just a little lost when I look at the culture, oh, but the word of God is so true and so steadfast, sharper than a two-edged sword. So I want to dive into some really powerful stuff today. I want to start in prayer because my words will be jumbled and not sufficient, but his word is always faithful and always carries power and authority. So pray with me, dear God, we love you, Lord. I love you. We thank you, God. You are holy. You are kind. You are powerful. You are full of love. You are full of authority. And yet still, you know our name. You know every hair on our head. You sit with us in the most intimate moments, and you call us yours. God, we just thank you for your great measure and might and your great intimacy and attention to detail in our lives. God, I just ask that this morning, today, this afternoon, as we get to come together as women, knit together by you, God, that truth would just move through this room. I bind up any weapon formed against us by the enemy. It, it, it cannot stand at the name of Jesus. I bind up any distraction, any spirit of fear, any spirit of shame, any spirit of guilt, any spirit of confusion, any identity crisis in this room. I bind it all up by the power of the Holy Spirit. I cancel its assignment and I cast it out. I send it back to the pit where it came from. This is holy ground. Where two or more are gathered, you are present and we have many in this room, God. So we just invite in your Holy Spirit, your loving kindness, your power. We invite it into this place. I ask that you move me out of the way Make the words that pour off my lips yours, not my own, God, and meet every single individual heart and story in this room and minister specifically to each girl's spirit. You know their stories. I do not. But you do, God, and you're so faithful. So we love you. We thank you. We commit this time to you. Amen. Whew. Okay, so one thing I'm really passionate about, and y'all are just going to learn this afternoon, um, my first book is Wreck My Life, but my second book is called Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot. And y'all are like, oh my gosh. But that's okay. We're going <laughs> we're gonna to move through a lot of this really good meat because God has so much to unpack to his daughters, and I'm excited and passionate about seeing God's daughters activated, seeing us walk in the truth of purity, to walk in the truth of the fullness of who he says we are and what he has for us. It's what my heart beats for. But in reality, we can't really talk about sex. We can't really talk about struggles in that way. We can't really talk about purity. We can't really talk about much of anything if we don't first address the aching, bleeding needs of our hearts. You see, I find a lot of the time we want to kind of stand at the pulpit and shake our frustrated fists at the world about the failing morality of our culture and about the struggles that are kind of pervasive through middle school, through high school, through young adulthood. We want to address all those individual things, but it's like trying to put a Band-Aid on bullet holes because we're not actually addressing the aching, bleeding needs of people's hearts. Everything, every sin in our life, every struggle in our life, every confusion in our life, they're symptomatic responses to struggles at the core of us, the root of our spirit, of who we are, who God says we are. And I'm not so naive to think that just because we're at a Christian academy means that every single heart in this room understands fully who they are in God's sight and is activated and on fire to be used as a vessel by God. No, there probably are kids in here whose parents pay for them to come to this school and kind of roll your eyes through chapel, and you're like, who's this large woman up there in a large blazer? This is mundane. It can, we can get used to it. It can get rhythmic. There are probably hearts in the room that know Jesus and have prayed the prayer like five times but haven't really seen much transformation in their life. There are probably hearts in the room who have had a circumstance happen to them or an adversity enter their life. Maybe it's divorce. Maybe it's death. Maybe it's, 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 ooh, we're about to go there. Maybe it's pain someone's inflicted on you. Maybe it's some piece of your story, some chapter has intersected that has scorned you or pained you to the goodness or the faithfulness of God. So you're like, yeah, we can talk all this. I can know a lot about God, but God didn't come through for me. 
when things got really hard. And there may be some hearts in this room who are fired up, filled with the Holy Spirit, walking through storms with their eyes set on the king, knowing who they are, whose they are. We have a variety. I'm not naive to think that we're all at the exact same place because I know when I was your age, I was at a very confused, broken place. And I would not show it on the outside. Oh, we're women. We could win Academy Awards for how good we are at faking fine. We are expert actresses. The masks we wear are incredible, and we're talented at convincing people what we want them to believe about us. But God sees right past and looks at the heart. And when I was your age, when I was in your season, my heart was just confused, and it was aching. I was a perfectionist. I was an athlete. I wanted control. I wanted to kind of dictate how my life would play out and, and, and how things would progress. I moved from middle school to high school wanting to control a great number of things. Those things didn't come to pass. Athletically, things weren't progressing how I wanted. Socially, I walked into high school six feet tall, all out of proportion. I mean, just a straight bobblehead. If you see me eye level, I can't even wear hats. My head is so large, and it's always been this size. So high school, I, I've grown into it a bit, but high school, I was just awkward, so socially, I didn't fit. Relationships weren't panning out how I hoped with friends, with guys, because I wanted guys' approval to like me even at home with my parents doing some acting, some radio work, some modeling pageants. That wasn't progressing exactly as I hoped. There were a number of things I wanted to control. I realized I had no control, and so the enemy found me in that place and found that chink in the armor, and I didn't know whose I was. I knew a lot about God. I could have told you a lot about God. I was raised in a Christian home. I could have told you, you know, sort of the swing of scripture and kind of a zoomed out view. I could have told you a lot about Jesus, but I did not know Jesus. It's like God in a box, church on a checklist, a cross on my necklace, and we're good to go, right? Like I can punch in my ticket when I die and, and God will see just how much I showed up. But I didn't know Jesus, and he certainly wasn't the Lord of my life. And so when control started to slip away, the enemy convinced me I needed to control something, anything. And that, for me, manifested into just a vicious eating disorder. Struggled with anorexia first. It evolved into bulimia, and that evolved further into a combination of the two conditions where there were days I'd eat an apple, make myself throw up 9, 10, 11 times a day. I started logging, charting calories in and calories out, and becoming obsessed, fixated, move through high school. And what I kind of describe, it's such a weird metaphor, but I'm a little weird. I, I, I got this picture of just this helmet of mirrors. And I just moved through high school only seeing my wants, my needs, my thoughts, what I thought about myself, what I didn't like about myself, what I wanted to control, what I wanted to be different, where I wanted to fit, how this group wasn't accepting me, what I wanted, it was like this helmet of mirrors and all I could see was myself. And I didn't like what I saw. I hated what I saw and I hated myself. So I struggled with an eating disorder, went off to college, kind of tried to crawl out of that, got some help, got some counseling, began to kind of pursue God and what it might mean to give up a little bit of this control and was doing well, was was prospering, I was learning, and then after my freshman year of college, my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger out of the blue. Suicide entered my story. And adversity suddenly went from, God, you're good, I trust you, all right, I can do this Christian thing. Suddenly adversity tipped the scale just far enough and it became, God, you're not good. You must not love me, you must not see me, you must not know me. If you're such a good God, how could you allow this disaster to happen? So I began to navigate through depression. I took off running from God, had to go back to college, and again, I could have a shelf of Academy Awards. How good I was at faking fine, even though I'm grieving and broken, I began to struggle with anxiety, overwhelming anxiety. And y'all, don't let it be missed. This generation is dealing with overwhelming anxiety. Pressure 
to perform. Who are we going to be? What are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? All eyes are on you. Everyone needs to see everything you're doing. Share it. And how many likes will you get? And what will my parents think? And what will my teachers think? And how will that grade come back? And we're crushed by anxiety. And I navigated through this season of depression and anxiety and acted out in promiscuity, seeking any sin-sized piece to fill the God-sized hole in my heart. Alcohol, I won't act like that's not happening, middle school and high school. Seeking anything that could maybe just numb, really having to wrestle through who I was and what my life was at that time. It's almost a full year after my dad's body had been on a morgue table that I was headed home from Baton Rouge to Atlanta. And the cry of my heart was, God, if you're so real, do something. Just wreck my life. Just end it. Because I understand why my dad did what he did, and I see it as a viable option. That's how purposeless I felt. That's where a lack of identity will take us. It's not even worth living. It's not even worth trying. And I was headed home, and disclaimer, it's a dangerous prayer to pray. God, reveal yourself. Do whatever it takes. Wreck my life. I was headed home on the interstate, lost control of my Jeep, only car on the road, flipped it three times and landed upside down in a ravine at 1.30 in the morning, completely alone and completely physically broken. I had broken ribs, damaged my lungs, liver, broken my neck, damaged my jaw and face. And it was in that wreckage, hanging upside down, choking on blood, if we're going to get real graphic, that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, a very real, very tangible, very powerful God who some of us are like uncertain about or some of us are just kind of lapping up the vanilla American church version of, no, I'm talking about the God of the universe, the one who put the stars in the sky and knit you together in your mother's womb. The spirit of the living God came into that car and captivated my heart. I met a king who said, be still and know that I am God. I have plans for you. I have purpose for you. I want to use you. I call you beloved. I call you redeemed. Will you continue to let like the haphazard winds of life hopefully blow your broken pieces back together or will you trust me as the master artist to rebuild you into a new creation and to use you for my plans and my glory. What do you choose? And it was hanging upside down in that Jeep that I chose to actually make Jesus the Lord of my life because it was non-negotiable when you meet the living breath of God. And life changed dramatically. So I didn't always know who I was or whose I was, but when I came to know Jesus fully, really, when I came into relationship with Jesus. It transformed my heart. And that's where we have to root. That's where we have to get to. That's what deep down at the core of all of us is pulsing and aching and desiring and thirsting for. Living water. Transformation. That's who God is and what he does, you see, God's never been confused about who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made with purpose, with power. We can look even in Scripture, in Genesis 1, 27 through 28, right off the bat it says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Do you all know what this means? God's busy making the world, he's making the animals, he's making the sea, he's making the sky. And then it says he made human in his image. The epitome of God's creation. You are. Designed with perfect purpose, with power, both men and women. You see, we have a really confused culture that has a lot to say about you because you're a woman. And it's just screaming the extremes. Either you're a woman, stand up and and roar, we run the world, girls, come on, Beyonce. It's not the right message. It's extreme. It's you're a woman, so belittle man, they're not the same, they're, they're, they're too much, they've been too much, they think they know it all. No, let's fight back, we're woman, or the world preaches, oh, you're a woman. 
oh, well, you can't do this and you can't do that and you better do this and you better do that and you should probably this and you should probably that and you're less than because you're a woman and God never spoke to either of these extremes. What he said at the beginning was, I have made humans in my image uniquely, differently, with purpose, with power. I actually commissioned them, go forth, be fruitful, rule the world, rule over my creation, be constructive, be productive, know your identity, that you're made in my image, that you're worth everything to me, and that you are woman. That's a gift, a gift. And I happen to love it because I'm just going to be honest for a second. I don't want to go either of the extremes, but women are just unique. We're just different than guys. We're like polythought creatures. They're like monothought creatures. Like guys can think one thing at a time. It's like just one track. I'm married. I can say this. Women are thinking all the things all the time. If we were like computer screens, we have all the tabs open. It's like, how can I do this and balance that? And what is this going to mean? And how do I time that? And what are they going to feel? And, and how are they going to think about what they're feeling? What are they thinking about what they're feeling or feeling about what they're thinking? And guys over here are like, oh, a squirrel. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They do have great depth of thought, but I love being a woman. I love being a woman. Man, scripture, Psalms 139, 13 through 14, you, are create, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Do you all understand in looking at those two scriptures, you are not just here, you are his. Have you ever thought about that? You're not just here, you are his. He created your life. He wrote your days in the pages of the book of life long before you were living. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You are not, oh, just the third kid, and mom had them a little too close together. And I say that out of experience because I'm like, we have another kid, and my other kid's not even one. What are we doing? How is this happening? But God, you are faithful. But she's, this baby's not just here. It's his. That changes things when you start to see value in your life, and when you understand that he wants to use you in power and in purpose. But here's what I see when I look at the world right now, and here's what I see aching the heart of women. The enemy has so deceived us and so confused us and so overwhelmed us and so distracted us and his greatest like hunting ground are the daughters of the Most High God who do not know their worth or their value or their identity or their purpose. If he can take out warriors for the kingdom, he's got great victory. Oh, and we don't know we are set apart. We've been plucked from the world, seated at the right hand of God Almighty through the blood of Jesus, that we are his, not just here. When we doubt, when we wonder, when we are confused, the enemy will enter in and sell you lie after lie after lie after lie that will convince you that that's truth. You see, what we see in the garden with Eve is not that Eve just woke up one day and she's like, about to go rogue, time to sin. Let's head to the tree, la de do. This fruit looks good. No, Eve didn't just wake up one morning with the intent to be a bad person, distracted, off course, confused, lost. No, what happened was that the enemy entered in and tempted her. He said, you know, um, God's probably withholding something from you. What God has said about you and for you probably isn't enough. The direction and instruction that God's given you is probably not going to benefit you. You're not going to love it. You should just try this. And Eve took of the fruit and sin entered into the equation. And y'all, that's our lives. It's not like we're waking up one day and we're like, well, I've been the valedictorian and have great friendships and all is well, but Time to go buck wild. Where are as many guys as I can hook up with? How are the girls around that I can gossip about? Where can I lie? Where can I steal? Where can I cheat? 
No, we don't wake up and just thrust into brokenness. The enemy often enters in when we don't know whose we are, where we are rooted, what God says about us, and the fact that this word is good. It is good. It is holy. It is powerful. It is instruction meant to prosper us, that God knows what's best for us and has spoken it to our heart. No, we get a little tempted. We get a little confused. We haven't had people speak life over us or truth over us. And so the enemy says, don't you think if you just tried this or if you just did this or, oh, that guy's kind of interested in you. What if you just, oh man, you should get into the comparison game and you need the followers and you need the likes. And so maybe if you just, and it's the small stuff, you guys, there's no harm in cheating. Everyone's cheating. Just, oh, it's just a little white lie. It's not that big of a deal. It's nothing major. You can just, we make small decisions, and then another small decision, and then another small decision, and sin enters into the equation, and before we know it, we are purposeless. We are confused. We don't know our identity, our value, and we don't actually believe This word is truth. We allow the world to trick us, to compromise us, to tell us who we are and who we ought to be. And y'all, can I just say the world's definition changes every day for who you ought to be to be good enough. God's word has never changed. It's never failed. It's always been the same. And what God cares about is the condition of our heart. That we would know whose we are that we would know that his instruction is good, that we would know that he loves us. My goodness, he sent his son to the cross to die for us. He gave his life for us. That that great love would compel us to stand firm, to allow him to transform our hearts, to allow him to minister to us, to allow him to rebuild us so that we can stand up as warriors. Who's a Black Panther fan? Anyone see the movie? My jam. You know those female warriors all staked around Black Panther? Don't be mistaken. That's how God desires his daughters be. In the spiritual realm, ready, strong, steadfast, true, knowing who we are, knowing whose we are, knowing we've been given every bit of protection, every weapon we need, knowing that in great love we can see transformation, that in surrender we can nail our lives to the cross and see resurrected identities and stories and hopes and futures, knowing that his word is actually good and that maybe we would actually start to look a little different and see some transformation in our school if we started reading this and believing it and etching these words onto our heart. See, we can say we get it all day long. We can talk the talk. I mean, I'm as an expert at talking the talk. And that's fine. Maybe it'll get you through and you'll coast. But I just wonder who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Who hungers and thirsts for their identity. Who hungers and thirsts for activation and commissioning. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will see God, and I want to see God, not just the day I die and stand before him, but every single day of my life. Not just Sunday, not just in chapel. I want to be a woman who knows I'm not just here, but I'm his, who knows who I am and whose I am, who knows that no matter our circumstances, or our life, or our pain, or our shame, or our guilt, or our sexual backstory, or our baggage, or our affliction, or the pain inflicted on us, whatever it may be, can we be women who rise up and stand up and say, God, search my heart, create in me a clean heart, transform me from the inside out, because I want to be used by you? That's the great question. Then we can start to address the stuff that comes out of it. But if you don't know whose you are at the root, if you don't know you are fearfully and wonderfully made, if you don't know you are woman and that means incredible beauty and power in the kingdom of God, if you don't know you're a daughter, then no other preaching is ever going to make that much of a difference. If you haven't handed over your heart for him to transform, then this Christian walks just behavior modification, not heart transformation. 
and it'll leave you dry, and it'll leave you dehydrated, and it'll leave you like the woman at the well, thirsting. Oops. Okay, dear Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask you for grace from our teachers if we're running late to class, God. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for seeing us, knowing us, loving us. God, I just pray that these girls would draw near to you. Scripture says that you draw near to us when we draw near to you. Would some fire be set in their heart by the power of the Holy Spirit? Would they feel a desire for activation? Would they allow you to transform their hearts and know that it begins first with with transformation from the inside so we can move in power on the outside. God, we just love you. I thank you for these girls, and I ask that you just be with them, equip them, teach them, and grow them in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go to class. Go to class. I'll see you this afternoon. (laughs)